and do a quick introduction. Dean Morrison, I'm much louder than you. I can hear myself. Um, 720 uh, management entertainment business here in LA. Partners with uh, Dead Mouse uh, with our venture fund, 720 Mouse. Um, we also partners in his label, Mousetrap and Mousetrap Publishing. Cool. Uh, Colin Razo um, from Melbourne, Australia. Uh, we are two global, so we're a platform, a digital platform that provides APIs or turnkey solutions, 95 million tracks, manage the rights, reporting, other things like that. For people that are trying to do something with music, and uh, today I guess we talk about that something being a um, Web3 execution. I'm Braden Pierce, I'm from LA, and founder CEO of uh, Soundromeda. It's a music metaverse, an outer space themed environment designed to be the next level experience for how we experience music. Uh, it's kind of a culmination of my life experience, 20 years of being a music artist, 10 in experiential marketing, and five in uh, crypto. So I'm excited to talk about how we, I, I, we were approaching the sound of the metaverse. Awesome. Okay, so um, one starting point for this conversation is actually rooted in technology. So that's where we'll begin today. And one of the most neglected but important questions in this conversation is why blockchain? What parts of this industry or what problems that we're addressing need to actually be on chain? Is blockchain a solution? So I'd love to hear from each of you why it is you thought it's important for part of your industry or business to actually be on chain. Brady, you want to start? Yeah, sure. Uh, well, I think that blockchain can just in general solve a lot of problems in the music industry, uh, first and foremost, on how uh, you know, uh, uh, royalties are paid out. It's a long and arduous process. It's been antiquated through pros. Uh, I think you can simplify the whole process uh, exponentially, uh, but that would save a lot of time, and, and which means a lot more money by putting it on the blockchain and um, and just having it be more of an instant payment instead of waiting for 30, 60, 90 days for the royalties to come in. Uh, that's one way. Um, uh, I think that there's a lot of ways that you can apply uh, Blockchain technology to make things more efficient. Uh, yeah, but that's just one good way. Yeah, cool. Um, I guess from uh, our side, there's obviously a lot of there's a lot of impact of blockchain across the industry, whether it's reporting, uh, rights management, etc. The area that I think we've been certainly doing uh, a number of um, initiatives in is we. Think of our customers as being DSPs, and they're in various markets, and they're often got either niche pro um, projects or um, might be fitness industry. But if we look at some of the emerging markets we're in, and we've got um, applications in the Pacific Islands, Ethiopia, Ghana, other parts of Africa, through to then the major areas, we've been focusing a lot on how can we bring additional value to those local artists and help them actually make a decent amount of money for, through the DSP. And the DSP is part, being part of this process. And so blockchain for us has been, how do we, can we start to bring NFTs both into a Web 2 and Web 3 world, and maybe we'll go to that a little bit more later, and can the artists now start to actually bring forward revenue by potentially fractionalising rights? Can they start to actually be more in control of their revenue streams and, um, and, and yeah, ultimately bring more, more control and the ability for many of these cultures to really exist um, from a music perspective where it's such a struggle? It's good. Well said. Um, from my point as manager, label owner, publisher, both of these points are, are really relevant. I think our systems have been broken for a long time. And we, we're we not here, I don't think we're here to fix the broken system. We've got to build the new. And technology is allowing us to build what we think has been broken fundamentally for a long time. We're not going to overnight change universal music moving on chain or some music publishing on chain. They've all got departments that are looking into 
Web3, blockchain, crypto, and everything else because they know what's coming. You, you, the people out there that are fighting it, they're fighting for because they don't want change because it's going to affect how they control money and control rights. You know, what from a management point and a, and a builder and an investor, you know, we want transparency and we want to be able to connect with our fans in a really simplistic way and not be told how to do it by gatekeepers and then having to pay that platform to be able to talk to our fans. And I think blockchain is finally going to allow us to have a, have a two-way street of, of value. It's finally going to be allow us to be able to give things to our fans. We can't give anything to our fans right now. We have to, if we want to do that, I have to pay Mark Zuckerberg or somebody else or Apple or somebody else. I can't even get to my fans. I can't even send them a message. I can't give them anything. So I think that's what's exciting for us. We did that really early on with the Dead Mouse Avatar series where we just basically said, you know, for the start point of this position is you will have a guest list for life. That's the first thing you're going to get as a value for buying this. So you already, it's kind of nearly paid for itself if you went at five gigs. So all of a sudden we're giving value back for something that we're asking you to purchase. Because what we've done in the music business is all we keep doing is asking our fans to do something and we give them nothing back. Spend your money, spend your money, spend your money. Stream, buy tickets, buy merchandise. And we can't give anything back. So blockchain, as in the technology layer, is the first start of the foundation for everything else that we're going to be able to build on top of digital currency, whether it be NFTs or any digital collectible. I think NFT has become such a toxic word. That's, it's because it's overpriced monkeys and JPEGs. And, <laughs> you know, everyone's got down this, you know, the fun out there is out of control. But it, it means non-fungible token. It's a digital receipt for something that you own. Uh, so I sit at the blockchain level, Solana is now in one. Most of you probably already know that, but just in case, uh, building something new, to your point, isn't always pretty. Um, and in fact, when we had dinner back in February, we were talking about an event that you did with Deadmau5 that uh, it, I think was a while back, uh, maybe even a year before that, where you individually onboarded people to their first wallets. That is an unacceptable entryway to this new future that we're trying to paint that disintermediates the possibilities for fans to engage with artists, to engage with industry. What's required from the blockchain level to reduce those barriers for entry? Wow, I could be here all day, all day on this one. Um, the, I'll explain, I'll explain, I'll explain that what we were doing. So we had a pop-up store in Denver. It's happening again next week, exactly nearly a year ago that this happened. We work with a bunch of uh, IRL artists, street artists that we love to work with. And um, and that artist was sitting down with a fan. They picked a, uh, a subject. He then drew it for them in, in front of them. We then took a photo of it. We minute it in real time on Solana. And then you would then set it to your digital wallet. At that point, um, one of my staff had to go and fake it and start it, the whole process, because nobody would sit down. Everybody, like, was, you could see the fear in people's faces, right? And that's it. I mean, you know, we haven't even scratched the surface yet, you know, in, in anything that we're doing. It makes a hell of a lot of noise. But, you know, what that educational process, once one person had done it and then everyone, and then all of a sudden there was 10, 15 people around the table going, what's going on? And then as we were doing it, we were explaining it. And then, well, I've just got to give you my phone. Yes. Wait, what happens now? What are you going to do on my phone? Uh, and then, is this hackable? Am I going to lose all my information? Are you going to steal all my credit card details? Possibly. Right? So I say to everyone, to the, how is it going to take it to the masses? Security and trust. 20 years ago, no one looked at everyone, looked at you like you had five heads if you said, oh, yeah, my credit card's in, in my computer and I buy stuff online. People went, hey, what? And everyone, and there was fraud everywhere. But now we trust it. And now we have our phones 
and all of our ideas and we walk up to a machine and we tap it and we get annoyed if we can't do that anymore. That's that's the progress. That's where we as an industry have, have got to get to. And, you know, the metaverse is part of, of this technology build. I completely agree. And I think there's an equal part, um, both in terms of the tech stack, which you can think of as just the creative surface area for artists and industry to work on top of, but it has to be accessible. Um, I think one of the beauties of blockchain is that things move very quickly. And I'm sure this year's event is going to have a very different feel than last year, given the kind of progress in technology. Um, and given that progress, there's a lot of ways in which music and Web3 music can integrate into the broader crypto landscape. I'm curious if you guys have an example, and maybe Khan will start with you, of where you think that's been done effectively. So when I say kind of traditional crypto, I'm thinking about DeFi and DAOs and things like that. Yeah, I'm not sure I can think of places that's been done particularly well, to be honest, at the moment. It's very much an emerging area. I think, uh, you know, uh, Audius as a platform is an interesting place where it's it's probably still struggling from a content perspective, but as far as a platform is an interesting way that people are starting to be able to consume um, uh, uh, um, Web3 music in that space. I think broader than that, um, yeah, we're, we're, we're certainly working internally on our own experiments around what does it mean to have a Web3 experience that includes music. And, you know, we we had some concepts and really struggled to have partners come on with those concepts. So we thought, well, we, I guess we just got to build this ourselves and show people how it works. So, you know, we're currently building, some, uh, building in Decentraland and being able to have areas for artists and our clients to be able to brand and have an opportunity to showcase their artists in that space. Because I think we really need that experimental nature of people being able to come in to an area that doesn't become too technical for them to execute. And then what do we learn through those experiences and how do we change the um, the access points, right? You know, and, 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 you know, we're very invested in it. It has to be, it has to be a lot of fun, right? I mean, that's really the, the groups that are coming there. But at the same time, in our view, we're not looking at it as being just Web3. We're saying, you know, there needs to be an access point from Web2 into Web3 and be able to have people sort of traverse from a Web2 experience, which might be an app or might be something else, into a Web3 world and start to taste that world. And what does that mean for them? So, um, so yeah, and that doesn't really answer the question. I guess we're sort of all waiting for that great execution that's in the market. I, I guess I could give a, some thoughts on, on DAOs. And I think in general, with, with uh, DAO structure, when it comes to music specifically, I don't necessarily think uh, it's a great usage. I think that there's a lot of pressure on what a DAO is. Uh, so if you, because uh, what is a DAO? It's amorphous. But so you drop the structure and organizational factor of what a DAO is and call it a decentralized autonomous community and realize you know, people are there for shared common interests. And let's say an artist has specific needs, the artist management can go to that community and say, hey, you know, uh, we need to have this to happen. This is a little mission. Who wants to join and help complete this goal? Well, you can mobilize like a mini pop-up DAO scenario, uh, complete that mission, and then that sort of pop-up DAO dissolves until it's needed again. I think it's a really interesting and unique way to like, you know, use some of those structures and, and that engage in, um, uh, into the fan base uh, uh, with, with the DAO structure. Um, in terms of how some Dramata platform will be uh, implementing DAOs eventually in our long-term roadmap is to be fully decentralized and, and governed uh, by the people in a DAO. Uh, I think that's really important because uh, if you look at the previous iterations of web and applications that have existed, uh, they don't really last they're kind of like digital mud huts, right? And how do you build a digital kingdom that lasts? I think that, I mean, if you look at Facebook, for example, um, we all use Facebook. It was amazing. There was a period of time when, uh, you know, you had a flight page and you could call to action your, your people there, or you put up an event and people would show up. Um, you know, what if Facebook included the people of, 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 uh, of, their, of their application uh, with their next moves instead of just choosing greed? Um, I think maybe we'd be all still using Facebook to a degree. 
So I think by including the people of the application, the content creators, uh, the ones who are voyeuristically uh, you know, sharing those, that content and, and then taking that, I think by including that, uh, their, their perspective and their, their, uh, their ownership, uh, you, can, you can really actually um, create a, a product that's sustainable for more than just one iteration of web. I think everyone's aunts and uncles that they plan on avoiding at Thanksgiving are still very active on Facebook. <laughs> um, Thankfully. <laughs> so um, part of what everyone's kind of described here a little bit is this tension between uh, industry and technology. And actually, Khan, you were on the Music Tectonic podcast back in September, and you said, I'm paraphrasing slightly here, we're still seeing a lot of rights holders come to us about Web3. Initially, I think it was about traditional NFT experiences, and I think that's changing for artists and fans that are looking for more utility. And something we were talking about backstage a little bit was how much of this is a technical problem? How much of this is something that software and code can fix? And how much of this that we're all talking about here, the complexity of your work is rooted in non-technical issues that need to be solved? Yeah, I think it's almost all non-technical, to be honest, right? Um, you know, there's, there's an ability to issue a token. Um, that token, like we mentioned there, may not have any intrinsic value itself. It just gives the ability to actually have other utility issued against it, whether that other utility is benefits or a fan for from the artist, whether it is uh, concert tickets, virtual concert tickets, or other elements like that, that exists in there. I think the issue that we're still seeing is that once you move away from the independent space, and in the independent space, I think it's relatively easier that, um, especially if the artist owns uh, all their rights, right? Then they can start making decisions on what they're doing in this space. Once you move away from that space, though, and you move into the world of whoever owns the master rights and the publishing, you start getting into an incredibly complex area that sometimes is almost impossible to navigate at the moment. Now, I do think there's a real appetite that everyone wants to navigate it. Right, and I do think that's true of the industry. The industry's trying to figure out how to navigate it, but I guess we're moving from a, uh, a position of how business has been done forever to a new area, and everyone's trying to protect their current revenue streams rather than look at new revenue streams. And I think that occurred with streaming until those opportunities started to open up and people started to say, okay, so we can actually make revenue from these different areas. Some people have been left behind in that space too, right? Let's face it. But um, so, yeah, going back to your point, I think it's really around those structures that exist. And let's look at how, what are the opportunities that are presented by Web3 and how do we actually get to sit on the same page? Unfortunately, we're not going to be the decision makers in that process. So it's about getting that story and uh, narrative out there to the people who can make the, those decisions which I think predominantly is publishers and master rights owners at the moment, um, the, or, or rights owners in general. Yeah, it's this Everest, right, where each one of you have decided to take it on, frankly, and I'm sure on some days it's uh, really motivating to try to work through some of those challenges, and on other days it's an existential crisis. <laughs> um, and uh, I think it's an interesting time to think about what pieces of the industry that you're trying to approach with technology, which kind of brings us to the metaverse and the core of this conversation. Um, and this question, I think, in particular, is interesting for Dean and Braden, since you both have specifically chosen to build out metaverses as part of your core product offering. Um, I'm going to bring up one other element of but, not just industry challenges, which is metaverses generally as a topic have been criticized and some of which very fairly. Can you share your insights on what parts of the metaverse have been fairly criticized and which parts are misunderstood? What is the metaverse? Right, start there. Yeah. <laughs> I don't think anyone can in this room can accurately describe what it is. It's it's a word. How have you defined it for your project? 
Well, a dead mass is very, very clear. He laughs any time anyone says the word metaverse. He said people have been making video games where you can go in with your digital avatar for years. This is the evolution of what everyone is now considering as the metaverse. We're building worlds where you can go in with your avatar and do things and communicate and talk and earn things and collect and all of those things on chain in Web3. What's Web3? It's the evolution of the internet and the technology layers that are being built with the internet and around the internet. So Joel's very clear in what that is. I mean, in what we're doing at Pixel Links, uh, with what we're building there, it really is, you know, what we simplistically call it is the gamification of music within a gaming environment with your avatar. Go ahead. So, said it very well. <laughs> but yes, essentially, we already, the metaverse already exists. I mean, we, the internet is the metaverse. We are just getting now another dimensional experience of what the internet is. Um, yes, I just wanted to add that. Okay, I'm gonna keep probing here though, because we've all seen headlines or maybe even inter interacted with projects or capital allocators or any part of the participants in our ecosystem that present what has been there, has given the metaverse, whatever you wanna define it, the category, a bad reputation, right? And so what parts of the metaverse segment of Web3 are contributing to that FUD, and what parts are counteracting? Well, I, I think that Facebook changing their name to Meta confused a lot of people, because it's like Facebook has a really negative connotation socially, and they're just like, I don't know, we're like Meta, right? And so all these other projects that you know, were working on this immersive experience and you know necessarily didn't jump on the term Metaverse, they kind of just like, oh, okay, it was a bit cringe, quite frankly. Um, but additionally, like 96% of, of the people around the world aren't necessarily privy and into crypto and all these these like forward concepts. And me being in crypto for five years, it's second nature, I'm lost in the sauce. I couldn't imagine being on the outside looking in, you know, but it's really a small niche segment at the moment. And so I think it's like all these things, metaverse, NFTs, cryptos, and blockchain, it's, it's quite scary. Uh, and I think that ultimately a lot of education needs to happen. Um, and so that's a responsibility of this trillion dollar industry as a whole to do. Um, it's not on one responsibility to specific project, whether it be a metaverse related project or not. So I think that's gonna come with time and a dedication to educating uh, the people. Just like in the 90s, when you know when the internet first kind of came about and you, uh, I was in grade school and you know it was part of the curriculum to understand how to use the internet. So I think that that kind of stuff needs to be properly integrated within society as a whole. It was a passing fad, as many headlines. <laughs> exactly. Who's yeah. going to use this? Exactly. It's electronic mail. Like, what? Come on. Yeah, exactly. Here we are today. If I can add, though, one of the things that's always, uh, I think, not sorted, certainly at the moment, we need to work through is that question of interoperability, right? And so, you know, there's a lot of different things that are described as metaverses at the moment, whether it's a sandbox, Roblox, um, Decentraland, a ton of others. And so how, though, do we build something? When we think of the internet, we think of being able to move seamlessly between areas within the internet, but that's not true of uh, metaverses at the moment. So I think the next phase is certainly where interoperability at least to a degree that allows, you know, um, potentially a wearable that you have in uh, one world to be able to be used in another world are really important because it allows the artist, it allows whether it's a brand, other people start to build value and not have to look at all these as discrete executions. We're early in the game, but it's, it's definitely worth noting that that's something that we're needing to work through at the moment. Yeah, I think uh, the ambiguity around all these terms is still yet to come. You know, none of us really will be able to predict what this technology holds. I don't think anyone, you know, developed the app store and thought that the most culturally relevant thing to occur there would be Tinder, you know. <laughs> but here we all are kind of like building on this tech stack to try to see what connects culturally. And I think that was one of the theses from the keynote, which is around engagement and 
and where do humans find the ways to engage with technology? And I think one of the things that's been very successful for different projects that are on this frontier is creating some of the boundaries related to your own categories where they don't yet exist. So Pixelinks has had some success in that area and something I'll, we can confidentially share among Scuff's girls here is that you'll be announcing next week at Web Summit that there's an acquisition that's in play. Oh, wow. Something that you'll be able to kind of like celebrate more publicly. But Web3 is not at all accustomed to traditional forms of corp dev or MA. And partially, I think that has to do with really being clear about what you are and what you are not. Um, would you share with people a little bit about how you've been able to carve out your kind of product market fit and result in an exit? One of the key people was in a room. She sat over there, Lindsay, who was Joel's lawyer. Um, if it, you know. Sorry. <laughs> um, her and, and Dina LaPaul from LaPaul Law have, have really been at the forefront of trying to change laws and bring, drag a very old antiquated system of musical rights and terminology into the modern era. And I think, you know, we've been four months in negotiating this deal and it's been an eye-opening experience of education for the gaming side of the business. And you realize why the gaming side of the business hates the music business so much. Because it, I think we talked about it earlier on, it's horribly complicated. Nobody understands the rights. You know, we were on the 99th hour and uh, the word PRO come up. And, uh -huh. and then everyone went, sorry, a what? <laughs> And nobody on on that side of the fence had a, any idea what a PRO was. They had no idea what they did, how to get a license, what it means, that there are one in every major country around the world. We had to spend an exorbitant amount of hours and weeks and days explaining this and, and trying to educate them. That, and, and then we realised, myself and Ben Turner, who manages Richie Horton and heads up IMS and AFEM and many other great organisations about trying to educate and, and help societies um, is that our responsibility is to help Web3, is to help gamers and builders understand and then work with PROs and publishing companies and majors and everything to try and make this, I want to be able to licence a piece of music. Okay, how do I do that? Where can I go to be able to take a box and say, okay, I've got the rights I need, great, off I go. You know, it, you can't do that right now. And, and so we're currently building for non, you know, with independents, independent artists, independent people that own both sides, masters and publishing, and they own it 100% both sides because that's the only thing that we can do right now because it's, it's not built yet. And like Con said, you know, we're a long way to go from people that have spent a lot of money buying a lot of rights. Market share you hear all the time. Corporate America or corporate worldwide is about what do I own and what is the value of it? Now I have to protect it. So we put up all the walls. Well, I want to do that. I will never forget it. And it's just a quick anecdote is we were in a deal with um, Universal a long time ago and um, we we, we had a big record at the time of Ghost and stuff, and Usain Bolt would just set a world record. And then a week later, he set another world record, and my friend at Puma, who we just done a deal with, said, he wants to do this viral piece on YouTube, and he's walking into a bar, and he wants to use Ghost and stuff, and they've only got $15,000 as a budget, because it's a viral piece. And I was like, great, I'll do it. So I did tell the record company, I want to do this, and then they say, Sure, because we were in a 360 deal, so they had to do it. And then the publisher goes, no. And I go, what? I said, it's Usain Bolt. This is amazing exposure. It's going to, the record, record's going to go amazing. Well, as a company, our standard set fee to deal with Puma about anything that's forward-facing is $40,000 minimum. And I go, but I want to do that. We can't do it. We own your rights. That's uh, 
one of those like stories I feel like yeah. people that have worked in the industry long enough, everyone has a version yeah. of that that you know kind of kills your soul just a little bit. Um, I think uh, it wouldn't be right to not talk about independence and creators because that was a core part of you know, why everyone thinks this is meaningful. And so, Braden, I think that's a particularly relevant question for you since uh, part of your initiative began as a creator. Do you want to talk a little bit about your personal story or personal experience? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I've, I've been a, a singer, songwriter, instrumentalist, music producer, DJ, indie record label owner, music marketer. Um, uh, I've been a music band my whole life, but on definitely on the, on the indie level, I've had many bands, I've had songs, I've had millions of plays. Um, I've, I have friends on all, uh, every level of success in the music industry, from stadium uh, packing acts to, to guys that play the local dive bars. But the reality is, um, you know, we're all kind of frustrated about the music industry, right? And so from the indie level, uh, some drama was built with equal parts inspiration and frustration. Frustrated because it's hard as an indie artist to get your music heard. Uh, you turn to, you know, playlisting services and 98% of them are, are you know, scams, right? Or getting your post heard uh, to your fan base, you gotta boost that post. Um, being a content creator on TikTok is not the same thing as being a music artist, right? Getting a small piece of that revenue pie is just not cool. So, um, you know, after five years in crypto uh, and, and knowing that um, uh, uh, every artist needs to kind of have like a, a sort of a visual companion or stuff companion to, uh, to having a, a new release, I envisioned like what I really wanted to share with my own music. Um, it was basically um, a, uh, an outer space themed galaxy where every song becomes an audio reactive immersive world. And from there, it ought to become this sprouted um, uh, you know, we could, I, to me, I, I was like, well, wait a minute, we can solve all these problems holistically with a new way to experience music. It's much more than a CD booklet, uh, more than a music video. Uh, it's alive, it's, it's moving, and uh, you can connect with your fans uh, in a whole entirely new way by completing games and winning NFTs. Um, yeah, so it just all kind of snowballed from there. I'm look at my notes to see if I missed anything. <laughs> But uh, I mean, when I, basically, like I want to bring back the fan club, connecting with your fan base. You know, I, like when I was a kid, I sent ten dollars in cash to the Pearl Jam fan club, and in return, I got this little vinyl. And I didn't even have a record player, but it meant everything to me. And I look at that, and I was like, that's an original NFT. So where is that spark now? You know, and so our approach on Sound Drama is to just you know ignite that spark and make that nuclear in the most beautiful of ways, and wrap that in an outer space themed environment because uh, who doesn't love outer space we're all like look at the sex of, look at the success of star wars and star trek and and all that there's something really powerful about that and I, i've loved space since i was a kid so it just made a lot of sense to me it's a bit of a cathartic uh, expression to do it all and uh yeah. i think it you know it's so fundamental to think about how fans change the way that they want to engage with music as well and ultimately you know it doesn't mean that everything will have to change but there should, certainly should be new opportunities and fans are kind of the final theme of today's discussion. We'll have one more question. I see I have zero minutes left, uh -huh. um, which is always why I take one more question. Um, and actually, this one's for Dean, and this is something you wrote on LinkedIn, which my much less respectful peers would call Boomer Twitter. And um, on LinkedIn, you wrote about fan tracing. Do you remember this? I did my homework. No. Okay, so you said, Fans and artists currently don't have a human relationship. Consumption and distribution is a one-way transaction, but real human connections don't work that way, at least not with my friends and family. Social media and Web2 added a new dimension of creator-fan relationships, but it still doesn't feel fully authentic. Everyone wants to feel seen and heard, especially fans. Fans and artists are human. That relationship should reflect that. So tell us about what you guys are trying to think about, what you're developing to try to address some of the things in that comment about fans. Um, you know, we started using Discord because Joel was a gamer. He is a gamer, he's not, he was. Um, he's a huge PC, Steam gamer. Discord was the way that they chatted. Long before NFTs existed and community word was, was the buzzword around NFTs. We've always had a community. They're called the Horde. They are Joel's super fan. 
and they will do anything, go anywhere, try anything. And that is what we've done for 20 years nearly now when I've been managing him. His, his remit was, I want to be the first. And I want to I wanna be the first through the door as many times as I can. And, I, and that is why it's fun being his partner and his manager because, you know, there's never a dull day. Joel's always got a million ideas. He always wants to do something different. But it became really apparent, and our Discord is out of control. I mean, it, it gives me anxiety when I go in there because it's so noisy and the subreddits and this. And, but it really, when you look at it, it came from Reddit, which was, you know, really easy to use and the fans could, and you would go in there and when you couldn't get out, he said in, in Twitter, he would go in there and he's very well written and he would go in there and verbally diarrhea with his fingers. And the fans would absolutely love it. And then he would stay in there and communicate. Then Discord happened and he would be doing the same there. Now, Discord is, is kind of our control and, and we now, what's next? We I think we're all absolutely aligned on we just want to be able to communicate in a, in a really clean, symbiotic, non-gated way with our fans. We want it to be a two-way street. We want, they want to be the, the super fan wants to be the first to know. They want to be able to engage. They want to buy. They want to collect. Digital collectibles are really the next is what is exploding for us. And we'll, whether it's a power app, whether you're getting it for free, Absolutely. whether you're at buying it or whatever it is and you're being able to trade it. We started with a physical pin series that we do on tour. I didn't know they were going to go. We just did all the different mouse sets. We put them in a, a vending machine and they were buying packs. And we thought we'd made enough for the whole last tour. We thought we'd made enough for the first six months. They went in the first day. I couldn't fill the machine quick enough. It was just standing there and open. And then, in real time, I watched the community in the lobby start trading. And I'm like, this is amazing. Now, they're all on Reddit and they're on Discord talking about how they want to swap stuff and where they're going to meet. And I'm like, this is incredible. And then, we found Wax.io and I was like, well, we're just going to replicate that on Wax. And then that exploded and that was really our first step into NFTs, just replicating something that we did in the real world. And we did it in the digital sphere. And that is simplistically put our remit right now with Dead Mouse and everything we do with all of our businesses. Super interesting. Um, okay, we have saved some time for QA. Five minutes. Anyone in the audience have any questions for anyone on the panel today? Yes. Really shout. Uh, it's actually for you. So as Solana, it's, you're in an interesting position given like the exposure that you have. Um, it's really making an impact on the accessibility of crypto and bringing in a certain demographic that just really is uninterested in wallets. What are you doing right now to kind of like capture that audience or plans to get there? So one of the things we feel kind of fundamentally responsible for is uh, trying to address things that we don't believe the ecosystem will be able to do. So that means, you know, network fees, making sure that at the cost of transacting on Solana, you never have to think about it. Keeping it environmental and sustainable so that people don't have to worry about, you know, how this compares to other chains in terms of the sustainability. The next phase, though, is actually really thinking about how can founders, business owners, actually create successful businesses? They know whatever problem they are trying to solve far better than we do. So experts in the music industry, is it a feasible service area for them as founders to actually develop something that makes them money, to run businesses on them? And we think that that integration of actually focusing on developers and founders as the gateway to onboarding users is the answer and that we actually don't hold the answers but it is our responsibility to make sure that the infrastructure is second to none we'll see if that solution or strategy works in the back sure. yeah. yes um, you are one second
Hi. Thank you. Um, I have a question. It may be sort of obvious, but I guess, you know, what is the sound of the metaverse? Because when we talk about kind of these artists that are going to drive this fan engagement on Web3, you're, we're kind of talking about a unicorn, right? Like you want an artist, an independent artist, who owns both their rights, but then in order to kind of get people who want to engage and invest in them, you know, they kind of need to have the benefits of having been run through the traditional music machine where their rights wouldn't, you know, wouldn't belong to them. So like, who is, who is the sound of the metaverse? I mean, I think Dead Mouse is like an amazing example, sure, but I think of him really as like an anomaly as opposed to like the norm, you know? I mean, I think about like Amanda Palmer, who's like kind of doing the metaverse on Patreon, but like, who else? Good question. Good question. Yeah, I think that there is a there is a community, um, and it's growing between like we're involved with a company out of Australia called Emanate, uh, who have a company called Blockchain Music, who are build a motor DAO as well. And you know everybody on that platform, okay. everybody on that platform is independent. Um, a lot of the people on Audius are independent. Um, there is a there is. If you look enough, there are a whole community out there that are Web3 focused, crypto, blockchain, and understand that this they are going to be the first superstars to come out of this new world. Like, who was the first? Like, Dead Mouse was the first superstar to come out of Beatport. You know, um, and there were, you know, who was the first superstar to come out of streaming? Is give every new, you know, platform or time or, 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 or time in place will be the next superstar will come out of a different platform or a different technology case. Because it will just happen. There's, there's too much talent out there. And, uh, absolutely. And actually, I think about half of all music now is released independently. So if there's 100,000 new songs every day, that's 50,000 new independent songs released every day. So the sound of the music and the sound of the metaverse can you know really evolve and escalate very quickly. Um, uh, yeah. Yeah, I, I was just gonna say, Con has an interesting perspective on this in local markets. Yeah, I, I, I think um, I think certainly um, the markets the the, the the let me get this right the. Uh, not first world markets that we're in uh, really are, or are often about the independent artists. They don't like them being swamped by international artists that then take most of the pie. I think, though, that presents a real opportunity for independent artists because speaking to people for arguments like this weekend who are really interested in things in Web3, they're all focused on independent artists because of the challenges with rights. So it does mean that where these artists have not been the focus previously, suddenly there's an opportunity for them to really emerge and become part of it. Um, certainly for us and our clients, I would say from our clients, the number one thing that's coming through is how do we create better and deeper engagement between the fan and the artist? And um, that's, that's great to hear that from the DSP perspective and understand then how does that actually get translated. Uh, I'd say it's a state of flux how that's happening, but there's a lot of different experiments that go in toward that, both in, both in Web 2 and what we're talking about today in Web 3. Awesome. Okay. That is our time today, but come and chat with us afterwards if you have any other questions. We'll be here to hang around. Like this.